Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. In this last presidential election, one of the most alarming things I'm seeing happening is the fact that people are learning more and more on government to be able to solve their problems. But as anybody knows, when dealing with the government at small as well as big levels, government's slow, sloppy, and very inefficient in very many ways. I always like to suggest to people, if you want to see change, why don't you start with yourself, find out the problems that are out there, and see what you can do personally about solving them. And if it seems to be a little too big for yourself, why not grow and find others who share like interests to see how you can achieve these very things? After all, we always hear this quote, be the change that you wish to see. Well, that should enact with all the people that you have around you as well as communities that you live in. On the program today, we're going to be joined by a guest who has a book known as 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. He is someone who helps communities identify what is holding them back from finding success and then help them overcome it. When they're not looking, he inspires and often shocks them with the presentation showing how they are destroying their own chance at success as well as helping them build back up and get them on a better path. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today, our guest, Doug Griffiths. Doug, thank yeah. you for being on the program today. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for that introduction. That was spot on. <laughs> well, it is because I am so sick, really, of people always talking about what our government isn't doing. And I say, you know, if you were out there proactively doing what you see needs to be done, Government has no choice but to fall into line. I mean, otherwise you don't get elected. Look, we were doing this without you. You know, if you're going to get in and help us, great. If not, find something else to do. Sell hot dogs on the corner for all I care. <laughs> yeah, well, and it misses the entire point of what community is. It's about people interacting, not about passing on responsibility to government. It's it's you, you, government can't build community. They can build towns. They can build infrastructure, but they don't build community. That's entirely up to people. Now, let's talk about communities, first of all. I remember uh, some years ago we were doing uh, uh, segments on communities which were far and above or different from what people might think of, for instance, the small town or the small inner city, things like that. But people who are building intentional communities, it could be the hippie commune where everybody does bartering, and, you know, and, and different things of the like. And the, the guest was saying, you know, it really depends on the philosophy, the attitude, and the direction a particular group wants to go. But what are we talking about here specifically? Well, for community, it's it's about relationships. And it's it, there is no uh, one description of a community, um, or one type of community, rather, because a community is really just a group of people that have a shared values and a shared purpose and a shared understanding that interact with each other. And so a community can be a, a town or it can be um, you know, the, the Idaho State Accountants Association. They, they have their community as well. We, we all actually belong to, for my estimates, over 100 communities, but we typically associate most strongly with about the top 10. Uh, and th that's the groups that we have the most in common with, right? We, we associate with folks whose kids play soccer and who are similar to our age. That's one group. And then we associate with people who live on the same block. That's another community. And then we have family members. That's another community. And so we belong to multiple communities, but their strength is determined by how we interact with each other and what we do to build it, uh, which requires us to own it. Now, how did you first get started on this path that you would consider to be your life's mission? Well, I I started, um, I was a rancher, and then I got a, a, I got a philosophy degree, and then I got a teaching degree, and I was a junior high teacher. Uh, and I taught in one community, and I ranched in another, and I lived in the one in between them. And I started to realize all of our rural communities were declining. They were, they were just it didn't seem like they were having success. So I started to talk about the need for community building, and that took me into provincial politics. It would be like state politics. And uh, I spent four terms, 13 years doing that before I resigned a couple of years ago and went back to community building. And the, the entire um, epiphany I had was when I taught junior high, I would talk to high school students about how to be successful, right? Um, study hard don't do drugs, marry someone nice. And they'd all look at me like, yeah, we know. 
but then it wasn't changing their attitudes or how they they move forward in life. So I I did a presentation out of the blue one day. I don't know why I did it, but I asked the kids to describe to me what it would look like if they ruined their lives. And, you know, they come up with all sorts of things like, well, I'd become a drug addict. That would ruin my life. And I would say, okay, let's pretend that's your goal. You want to destroy your life. How would you start today to become a drug addict? And someone would put up their hand and say, well, I'd, I'd, uh, I don't know, I'd drink way too much alcohol and get into heavy drugs, or I'd start by smoking a joint and get into heavy drugs. It, not that everyone who does that gets into heavy drugs, but you have to start somewhere. And suddenly they were analyzing everything they did based on what the long-term consequences could be. And even if they carried on, they were aware of not falling too far down the wrong path. And then I applied that com to communities because every community I've ever worked with in, my, in the last 20 years has got an economic development plan and an infrastructure plan and a community s development strategy and a sustainability plan, and, but they make decisions that sabotage their own success. And so I apply the same sort of reasoning. And the, the example I always use is that um, there are every community I've ever worked in, and that invites me to come and do a presentation and to help them, says, Doug, how do we keep young people in our community? But I could spend three days beforehand and listen to them say, oh, there's no hope in this community. There's no future. I don't know why people keep sticking around here. I mean, young people have to go somewhere else for hope and future. And <laughs> we do ever worse. And I, the young people sit there and listen to that. And why do you think they leave? So right. we want one thing, but we say things and do things that sabotage the very thing we're trying to accomplish. And that's why I wrote 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. It's about how the attitudes we have sabotage our own success. You know, I, I can't help myself, but I think of uh, sometimes the uh, movies that are out there that I feel inspired by because I was someone who grew up who always moved. I was like in a different school it seemed every year from kindergarten, even preschool, all the way up and through like the seventh grade. And it wasn't until then that I was in the same school for more than at least two years straight. And uh, so having moved around, I never really got that experience of being in an area per se where you get to, you know, you get to know people and people get to know you. you know, how, Dan, are you going to the store? How are you doing? You'd actually have a conversation about how your day was you know, before it was a matter of going in, getting the, you know, whatever you need and then getting out and, and being on your way about business. And one of them that comes to mind is the movie Doc Hollywood starring Michael J. Fox. And for the listeners out there, this is a story about a guy who is a, a guy who's an intern. He has a dream of being a doctor, specifically somebody who makes the big money. So he's on his way to Los Angeles to uh, land this job where he's going to be working with a plastic surgeon, I guess. His car breaks down in this small little town in backwoods somewhere and realizes here's an opportunity for him to be a small-town doctor, for instance, and seeing the benefits far beyond just making the big money and, and having the lifestyle that he wants. But he's not so sure that he wants that. But there was also one episode where there was a gal there who was uh, a, a young gal who was really tired of the town, and this was a place she grew up in, and she wanted to sort of go see the bright lights in the big city sort of a thing. And and you realize, wow, you know, there's such an interesting way that you have to decide where do I belong. But even though a community may seem like one of these small fictional towns as I'm describing, there's really a lot of work to having something like that. Yeah, there is. There is. It, it, it takes an appreciation for the community. The interesting part is, too often we think about uh, keeping young people or anyone else in the community. And the interesting part about that is that you know, the nature of youth is to go off and explore, to go try new things. You want them to go learn new ideas and, and sample different, uh, different kinds of life. The idea is to not keep them in your community. It's to give them a reason to come home after. And, and I say this all the time. We, we don't appreciate what we have until someone else appreciates what we have. And so there you have, right, Doc Hollywood in that movie specifically thought this is a, once you got to know the community, it wasn't a hick town, it was a beautiful community. But a lot of people in that community, especially that young lady, didn't quite appreciate what she had. And a lot of times when we're, we think we need to keep people in our community to help them grow, 
but we grow better by having new people come in that see and appreciate the quality of life we have. But the challenge is that when new people come in, we often see them as outsiders and keep them as outsiders and say they don't understand, they're not welcome, they, they don't understand the history, they don't know what we, how we do things around here. And yet that's exactly what you need to, to develop, to keep an appreciation for your community and a focus on helping it stay strong. Now let's go ahead and talk about some of the uh, reasons that you outline in your book that can, that can kill a community and the solutions that we're talking about. And it's really surprising, for instance, uh, what some of these problems are uh, as far as how they're created. And the first one you talk about is about water. I mean, without water, <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> you're, you're not going to have much of anything. It'll be kind of probably a tombstone situation with tumbleweeds flowing through empty little shacks. Yeah, we, we, uh, I mean, we can only go for three minutes without air, three, weeks, uh, three days without water, and three weeks without food, or we die. And yet, you know, I, I know all across North America, uh, we're trying to improve our water management because water is such a precious resource. I'm, I'm from Alberta, and we're, we're very heavily oriented to oil and gas. And I know a, a lot of folks I know say, oh, I think the next world war would be fought over, over oil because it's so important to our economy. And that may be true, but the last world war that's ever fought will be fought over water because whoever controls water controls everything. It is fundamental to agriculture, to value-added agriculture, to industrial development. There are communities all across North America where people want to buy a lot, build a house, start a business, get a job, raise their family, build equity, help build the community, employ other people, and they can't because we can't even supply the community with enough water. So we focus on water management to make sure that we're using it responsibly and then people get water bills. And I, all over for Canada and the U.S., I hear people say they're upset because they pay, you know, thirty or forty or fifty dollars for water, and yet most people I know still pay more than that for cable TV, something that you know you can live without. So it's, <laughs> Absolutely, it's, right? So mm -hmm. it's we I, again missing our priorities and and having attitudes that wind up sabotaging our own success. So there's lots of communities where the you know the the political leaders. Are, don't want to stir up that hornet's nest. So they say, well, we won't put water meters on. But then water gets abused and used, and then they wind up with a shortage like they did in California, for, because they, they, which could have been extended. They could have extended their way through it successfully longer if there was better water management. Um, and then we wonder why we were in trouble, because we didn't <laughs> want to pay a little bit for a water bill. And mm -hmm. that's yet you die without water. Mm. Now, I noticed, too, what was, uh, I thought, uh, Something that was insightful was the fact that you talk about how neighboring communities, well, they weren't so sure they wanted to actually share, even though nobody would really go without, so to speak, or have a lesser than. And so it's like other neighboring communities, there's the potential of causing problems for other communities that may be in need. Yeah, well, there, uh, you know, our municipal boundaries were, were drawn uh, hundreds in some places it gets to be 150 years ago and and you imagine the world the way it was 120 or 150 years ago I mean you were lucky if you had a horse to get to town and politics was based on how long it took a politician to ride a horse out to see you and the newspaper <laughs> came three days later and schools were built and you know we had one room school houses because it was how far kids could walk to school and uh, you know the world is a completely different place but I see so many municipalities that uh, communities that see those municipal lines, and they're like they're like little fiefdoms. Like they want to build a wall around them and keep people out, and not realizing that you know your success depends on partnering and cooperating with neighboring communities, not fighting them. They're in this world, they're not the competition. The people that are 20 miles down the road, the competition is 2,000 miles across the country, or or 10,000 miles across the ocean. That's where the competition lies, and we need to figure out how to work together to be successful. But we, we hold on to those lines in the sand. I was actually, two communities were, were, they hated each other. I don't know who did what to who in 1927, but they just had this long-standing animosity. I don't even think they remembered why they didn't like each other. And I was trying to help them get along better, and one person stood up at the meeting and hollered, I will not work with those people. They are the enemy. They're horrible. They, they are after our stuff, and they're, they're the enemy, Doug. 
And then another guy stood up in the meeting and looked at him and said, doesn't your mom live over in that town? <laughs> so I've, I've got a presentation called that I've seen the enemy, and it's my mom. Right. <laughs> it's just, it's you can't help but think about Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek as he actually tackled issues just that, like that very thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, one of the things, certainly in a community, that's important is to have a, an economy, uh, you know, a way that people can actually thrive and, and do new things. And certainly when we think of the small town, maybe what comes to mind for people is the idea of, the ranch or the farm. Well, we know that a lot of times ranches and farms can have a real tough time as it is, especially with government getting in and trying to subsidize farmers, which actually reduce what their product is. For instance, people think GMO, <laughs> non-organic, things like that. But let's talk about some of the other things in there because you were real eye-opening about how there's some entanglements that people can begin to see that actually have with somebody who's in a community, who's maybe in a political position, for instance, like a mayor, and actually causing problems with economic development and what needs to be done there. Yeah, well, you know, we all know the value of competition, right? It gives us a better price, better quality, better selection, and better service. And, and no business can be all four things all the time. But competition makes us better. But I've been to a lot of small communities where um, politics gets in the way of that. I mean, we, we stand up and say we value competition because it makes us better. But then we, it turns out we don't really value it. It's not a value. It's, uh, it's a hobby because as soon as we're the ones competed against, it, it disappears. And I, I saw a young couple I had interviewed. They had opened a gas station. And, and I found it interesting that they didn't open the gas station an hour down the road in their hometown where there was only one gas station. And I asked them why, and they, they had a horrible time getting business permits and development permits and zoning permits and everything ready. So they just gave up, went down the road an hour, and opened the gas station in another town. So I went and did some research, and I found out that um, a, a, they were the only ones that didn't know why they had such problems. So everyone else in town told me, oh, no, the, the, it happened to be the mayor at the time owned the gas station across the street from where they wanted to build and didn't want the competition. So he was, he was very pro-business, said, we need to make sure that we attract new businesses to town, but he did not want a gas station because that would compete with him. So he yeah. knew competition was valuable, but he didn't want competition with him. And it, you know, in that time, he, he charged a premium on his gas because there was no competition. There was poor quality. He got downgraded to a lower volume gas station. And when you ask him what the problem was, it wasn't that he charged five cents more or ten cents more a gallon. It was that... Uh, people didn't have didn't shop locally, but they were being gouged by them. So he he just he missed the entire value of competition. And it the, in that meantime, the the population of the community has continued to decline by about thirty percent because people would leave town um, not wanting to be gouged. They drive twenty miles down the road, and then they go get their groceries and they go get their hardware supplies and they go out for lunch, and all that money would leave town, and it's just uh, decimated the economy. And yet, he won't—he won't change the price or allow new competition in town. And he blames everybody else for it. You know, now take a look at that scenario, for instance. And I thought that would be an important one to bring up because, as I mentioned earlier, or what we were talking about is government. Government is in a situation where they lock themselves into areas that uh, you have needs. For instance well, allegedly anyway, you need to have a driver's license. You need to have a business license. All those, those things can be contended by the Constitution to say, no, you actually don't need to have any of these things. But for the sake of this particular argument here, that you need to have these things. So uh, there was a, a movie that my wife had turned me on to called Zootopia. <laughs> and it's a fun little uh, Pixar-style movie, but there's a scene where they end up going to a government office where the government workers were sloths, South American sloths. <laughs> and these things moved, of course, at a very devastatingly slow speed. And anybody who remembers their experiences in a Department of Motor Vehicles realizes you might as well bring a sack lunch and potentially dinner by the time you get your ticket called for some of the most basic things. So here's a situation with this mayor and his gas station 
doing the very same thing. Well, what are you going to do about the service and the prices? This is the way it is. I don't have anybody to compete with me, and, and this is something you need to have. And this is typically what government does. It embeds itself in a situation where there's a, a need, a necessity, if you will, and it delivers sloppy service and usually ridiculous prices and, and people just, uh, there's a lot of uh, argument from time to time about whether or not we should find a way to get these services that they, I shouldn't say offer, but these services into a more private sector where we can see that streamline better service, better prices, things like that. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I, I think um, what you're going to find is that the, the evolutions in technology that are coming are... Um, you know, there are so many industries that have had uh, dis massive disruptions because of technology. But government is one that hasn't yet, but it is the most prime and ripe for disruption. Because as we, especially, you know, the Generation Xers, Millennials, as they start to turn back and focus more on community building at its core um, and, and identify more with being a part of a community, you know, I, Generation Xers like me were always told you have to climb the corporate ladder, work 80 hours a week, that's your... That's what your future is. Oh, Generation joy. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so Generation Xers and, uh, have, are starting to change. And millennials, I think, are sort of leading the charge that they want a quality of life. They would rather um, ensure connections with their community and their family. They, they'd be fine riding a bike to work. They want to walk to work. They don't want to live in a suburb or a subdivision. They want to live in a community. And so when that changes, you have more... Uh, value placed on community than larger and larger governments because your response, your needs are met at the community level, not by your corporation or by the government. And so it's a, it's, you're going to see a transition, and then that's going to be, uh, because of technology is just integrated now into millennials' lives, you're going to see much more instant communication and response, and yet the government is so slow, it's going to become irrelevant if it doesn't learn to adapt to new um, the, the needs of citizens in the way they're used to. And it, I think government is facing the biggest disruption uh, it has ever faced. Uh, and most people don't know how to handle it or what to do about it, especially the government. Now, when you say disruption, what specifically do you see on the horizon? Well, so you watch um, the way communication has evolved. Uh, at, so millennials just... But they're, the reason why they don't aren't as inclined to work that 80 hours a week and climb the corporate ladder, you know, you hear um, later generations say they're they're spoiled and lazy and they don't understand. No, they're just in a they live in an environment where it's flat. It's not about this hierarchy where you you don't get your opinion listened to you until you're a vice president or the CEO or at some some higher echelon of power. They're used to working in these flat social environments on the Internet where your contributions are valued, not your title. And so now you, you imagine translating that to the rest of society, and when they're in communities, they're, they're looking for solutions, not for the title and power. Well, they won't care if uh, some politician comes in with a title that says, yeah, I'm going to fix your problem for you. They, they'll look around at their friends and say, well, let's go fix it ourselves. You're right. insignificant, irrelevant, and I'm sorry, but... I don't need someone to fix my problems. I don't care how fancy your title is. We take care of it ourselves. And that, that will make governments less and less relevant and less and less powerful unless they learn to flatten the hierarchy and be more responsive at the community level rather than, you know, the state will take care of it, the federal government will take care of it, you know, because each one has a higher echelon of power that they can exercise, right? The next generations won't care one damn bit about that. You know, and it's funny, too, when you talk about titles, somebody will rattle off their pedigree, so to speak, and then you realize, okay, well, that sounds certainly like a mouthful and pretty heady, but what exactly is it that you specifically do? And you'd be surprised at the kind of answers you get. It sounds just as heady as the rest of what they were telling you. <laughs> yeah, well, our our team has, uh, um, you know, the the filings were done to, for the corporate entity, but we've we've all started to change our titles to you know chief innovation officer, chief controversy handler, you know, because it it, it describes better what you do uh, in your role uh, and pushing change. So we're updating the website for that sort of stuff as we speak because I just think that reflects the new reality. 
Well, here's another thing, too, uh, and this is something that's becoming, a, I, I shouldn't say a new trend, but certainly uh, an eye-opening one, uh, because as we were talking about youth earlier, and certainly you're touching on it now, and, and the idea that you do hear about millennials being lazy and unmotivated, and, and I don't believe that's entirely true. It is in some cases, but what it is is they're shifting from the idea that you need to get out there, roll up your sleeves, and have this particular work ethic in a business that, as we've learned in the last couple of generations, doesn't really seem to care about the well-being of a worker. It used to be that companies, allegedly anyway, would take care of you, although I don't see putting 40 years into a place just to retire with a gold watch and nothing else. But the idea that, 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 that companies have looked to see their labor staff as a position of disposability. Now, with the millennials, as you were saying, they're certainly changing that landscape as well. Look, I'm coming to work. I'm giving you my time. And if this is the way that I'm going to be treated, I've got better ways to spend my time. And I actually really like that philosophy in them. Now, that looks like laziness, but the whole idea they're saying in an underlying way is what entitles you as an employer to think that you can talk and treat me you know the way that you're treating me, for instance. Yeah, uh, I I agree that that, that that transition is definitely coming. I mm-hmm. mean, we talked so much. You, you remember how you know IQ tests measure intelligence, right? And right. then they started to realize there are, I think they're up to seven levels of intelligence or twelve levels of in, or types of te- intelligence, right? There's physical intelligence, there's social intelligence, there's more diversity. We've measured everything at, uh, in society based on work ethic, but I think it's going to you're going to find out there's also community ethics, there's living ethics, there's there, there's more to life than working. And so I think you're maybe not the current generation of CEOs, but maybe the next generation of CEOs. I think we'll start to look and say, hey, I just want to make sure you have a good work-life balance, right? right. I, you know, everyone's going to work their time. Mm-hmm. and But what do you do after? Do you stay physically fit? Are you giving back to your community? At least we put it on paperwork now, and they say it at, at events, right? Oh, employers want to make sure that you volunteer and contribute to your community. But it's always the last thing on the resume. And it's always, I don't know that anybody, nobody ever loses their job or doesn't get hired because they don't have a lot of volunteer experience. Um, they don't give back to their community. They don't talk about the other things they do in their life. I don't think they get a job for it either, but I think that's going to change. Well, there's no, there's that's certainly true. In fact, I'll tell you a, a story. Uh, just not too long ago, I was talking with a woman uh, as uh, we were together, and she was talking about one of the main ways she earns her living is that she works in the restaurant industry. I think serving, bartending, and she realizes now that she's at a point where her children are pretty much out of the house. She was talking about how her daughter was about to be married. And I said, well, you know, now that you see a lot more of this free time with yourself, what are you going to do? And she says, I really don't know. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Would you say that what you're doing is something that has been a dream of yours all your life? And she says, I enjoy the kind of work that I do. And I said, but I'm asking you, did you ever have dreams or aspirations, possibilities? She says, I really don't know. And really what I was hearing from her, and I finally got to the point it didn't take very long to get there, it wasn't a matter that she didn't know. It was a matter of whether or not she could earn a living doing whatever her dream was. You see, now there's something really interesting for people to pay attention to there. So I applied a little bit further, and I said, well, did you ever consider volunteering? Now, that was the key. She kind of lit up for a little bit, and she says, well, No, I guess I didn't, but that would be a good idea. And I said, there isn't a single thing, let's say that you have a dream, regardless of what it is, that you want to perhaps earn a living in time, but there isn't really a single thing out there that you couldn't volunteer your time to learn from somebody. And you see millennials doing this quite a bit. They somehow find the resources that they have the time to be able to actually give their time in areas, as you say, that are meaningful. Now, I think that we developed that attitude as I'm a boomer, and we started this show more than a dozen years ago for people in midlife who come to that point where there's a bit of frustration in saying, I've been doing things my whole life the way I thought I was told I was supposed to, 
And these are the results that I've been getting, and they certainly don't feel in line with what my spirit and who I am is. So we try to inspire people by taking them in new directions with new possibilities. And certainly your book, I Opens, a lot of those. It isn't just about that stronger community and the things that communities may not be doing correctly to, to become stronger, but things you can do within yourself, how you contribute, because communities are built one person at a time. And the thing is, when you take a look at how we develop those attitudes, they go back to the days that we were in school, as you were saying. The idea was to get a good education, go on to college, get a great career, build a family, all those things that seem to get people trapped in life more than getting them to thrive, if you will. And now education, especially during these new election cycles, seems to be that one that jumps in there advocating about better education yet. I don't feel that our education, as traditionally been presented, has gotten any better. In fact, most people are beginning to say it's gotten worse. However, what I was going to mention as we were talking about the youth is that's even changing because now you're seeing online education. You know, how do you see education structures really dealing with that? Because one of the things they snivel and whine and scream about is the lack of funds. It's always about money. And that's something you hit hardcore in your book about. It isn't about money that's going to solve your problems. Let's talk about that. Yeah, it's that's the problem. We As soon as money comes into the picture, everyone loses sight of getting ideas and they chase the money. And money sometimes is necessary, but it always should be the last step in a solution. Because other, other people quit thinking when suddenly someone throws money up. They say, oh, great, let's get the money. Pretty soon there's a lot of board meetings, a lot of food, and nothing gets done except that you get full. <laughs> Exactly. Or, or you wind up doing something that's required to get the money instead of what's required for your success. And it, it changes your focus and direction. My, my eight-year-old, my youngest, um, he showed this to me. I didn't show him. When I'm home and he has a problem with math, I help him with it. But if I'm not home, he goes on YouTube and there's a, a young lady who teaches grade three who has uh, broken up math lessons into these five minutes um, Snippets. So he, he, he's gone through a bunch of teachers on YouTube, and he likes her best and her lessons. So he goes and finds one related to what he's learning, and she teaches the way he learns. Well, that's the future of education. And I, I, the interesting thing is he is so used to being on electronic devices. Like they don't even turn on the TV. They watch things on electronic devices that move with them. This is, this is first nature to him. And I, I know even when I was a teacher, I thought, oh, they'll never replace I thought, you know, they had added computers while I was doing my, I had to do correspondence by paper um, in a small school. And then when I was a teacher, I thought, well, they'll never eliminate the teacher from the classroom. And I, I think that's still right. They'll never eliminate the teacher. They'll eliminate the classroom. And everything will move online, and it will become second nature. And so for a lot of our smaller communities, they know how important the school is, right? You lose the school, who's going to move to your community? What families are going to come? Except... In a generation, that would be completely irrelevant. Everything is going to move online. And education is the, the, as far as it should be, the most important investment that we make. But our biggest challenge right now is that our education system doesn't prepare the, the coming generations for the type of society we're going to have. Um, just think, uh, you know, 40, 40 to 50 percent of all jobs are going to be lost. And they're not manufacturing jobs that everybody thinks they are that will be those. But pretty soon law will be automated. I mean, you don't need to get a personal opinion. It will tell you what the opinion is. Engineering will become more and more automated as, as machines and computers start to become more exact and make fewer human errors than we do. Uh, autonomous vehicles, the new technology that goes along with that, all of this is going to transform society more in the next 15 years than anything has in the last 120. And yet our education system is still uh, teaching kids for today's world instead of tomorrow's world, 12 years from now, when they would be graduating and going to university. And our universities aren't teaching kids um, for what they're going to need to know when they come out of school either. What, and you can't teach them so that they know the technology four years from now in university. You need to teach them in a way that makes them prepared to adapt to the new technology because it's changing so fast now. 
And that's why our education system is failing us. That's why millennials are frustrated when they come out of university and there's no job because their their jobs have their career their educations have not trained them for the the way the world's going to be in ten years. It's it's remarkable that I, I tried to write that book and I still have a lot of notes. I do a presentation about it, but it's hard to write a book about how things are changing because things are changing so fast now that you can't even print it uh, before things have changed again. You know, and you bring up something that I think the listeners should really be aware of, too, when you talk about universities and, and you see this growing national problem of student debt. I mean, these kids are coming out of high school now, going into college. Again, this is one of them situations where we were told that this was the right direction to go with our lives, and I've got a, a pretty cool little story about that as a side note, but... The fact is, is now these universities have realized you have now branded us into a situation that isn't unlike the government itself. If you want that passport to that great career, you've got to go through us, and we're certainly, if you don't have the money, we're going to make sure that we find a way to get that through these guaranteed government loans that will make sure you get this education. Now as you go out there and what we have allegedly educated you in uh, land you that job that you were looking for, you'll realize it's just not available. And now you've got the student debt. What are you going to do about it? Because you got to pay that back. It's guaranteed, and it guaranteed that we're going to get it back. And now you're seeing debt as these a lot of these uh, younger people coming out of college into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And I say, what is the motivation there? This is a nation that, as I even had one guest years ago say, we have learned to feed on our young. <laughs> I've heard that, and I thought, oh, my goodness, that just sounds ugly. But there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, well, I, 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 I always appreciate the value of an education. But I think we, uh, our challenge right now is that our education system has become one of those uh, large, entrenched type of institutions that isn't responsive enough to the future. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's going to kill us. It's, it's destroying our, our progressiveness, our ability to adapt and adopt. And so I think we need to make massive changes. Because, I, right, I mean, I just read an article out of the U.S. about a student who had $150,000 debt to become an accountant. And I thought, I mean, how debilitating. I, I mean, right. That's, that's an entire generation of work just to, just to pay that down so you can get the feeling like you can get on with life and get caught up. That's what's... That's what's leaving a lot of, of the, the next generations feeling just devastated because mm -hmm. this, this land of promise um, lived up to the promises it's made. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our challenge is that we fear change, not just individuals, but as society fears change. We get very uh, challenged with, with anyone that says that we, we need to adapt and change things. I mean, in, in where I'm from, um, you know, we've got a a lot of coal and a lot of oil and a lot of gas. And you talk about, I mean, we've got some politicians that say, you know, um, we're, we may have to leave some of it in the ground. Frankly, the way things are changing, I don't think we're going to have to. I think no one will want it. I mean, there are things that are just changing so quickly, we don't... I, I tell people about autonomous vehicles and how in 10 years, 35% of the popul of vehicles on the road will be autonomous. And five years after that, just 15 years from now, 85% of vehicles will be autonomous, right? And they will probably be primarily electric because, frankly, electric vehicles have, what, five moving parts in the engine. They're, they're virtually maintenance-free. And hydrocarbon engines have over 200 moving parts. That's why they're breaking down. That's why Tesla vehicles have, what, a million-mile warranty. So they'll, they'll, they'll move. They'll change. And people say, oh, it's not going to come that fast. Well, they forget Oh, it. I guarantee. In fact, I live in Portland, Oregon, and this year we're actually unveiling the public testing of the driverless car. And Portland, Oregon, if nobody has actually been to this city, I found as I was going to work downtown, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I thought, you know, I'm really tired of dealing with traffic, not knowing when I'll actually get downtown and get to where I'm going, but also parking was a real nightmare, uh, finding a garage that would charge you something that isn't going to stick you with a $30 bill after being down there for a couple of hours. So I started taking the bus, and then I started uh, paying more attention to that and their light rail system and so forth, 
And I was astounded even at uh, how it was so interconnected that at any one time during the given uh, heat of the day, let's say between uh, 8 o'clock, and, and, uh, and that's just kind of a guess, 8 o'clock to about, let's say, 8 o'clock at night, the efficiency of the system that waiting in a bus stop, I never usually waited any more than five or ten minutes for the next one to get me to where I needed to go. And generally, if you had to wait, there was a Starbucks or something like that that was pretty nice to wait at in the first place. It wasn't like you were out on some lonely street corner like you were back in the 70s. And and the fact was, is because of this efficiency, and for five bucks, I could get around anywhere I wanted to for 24 hours. Right. And I thought to myself, why not just, you know, kind of get rid of the car here? And if I need a car, why don't I go ahead and rent one when I go on trips? So now I found myself saving money on insurance and so forth. Now we're into a sharing situation where you see things like Zipcar. Uber has stepped in to take over where it's fighting cab companies now that used to have a monopoly. And monopolies are typically government things. But now you're seeing these businesses that used to think they had a lock on things beginning to find competition step in here as well. And I don't see too far in the future where that's actually going to happen to government as well. Yeah. Well, just to just imagine, yeah, there are, I bet, in Western Canada alone, uh, there's a close to $27 billion worth of requests from cities into governments to build new light rail transit lines. And we're just talking about half a dozen lines. And it will take 15 years to scope and site and then do the construction. Imagine 10 or 15 years from now, if you open the LRT, the light rail line, and no one shows up for the grand opening because Ubers are so, or autonomous vehicles are, are so proficient and so cheap and so affordable because there's no driver and there's no gas and there's no maintenance and they're on the road all the time. It just, and then imagine when you get to 15 years from now, 85% of vehicles on the road being autonomous, which is the first city that's going to say, you know, the danger in the system is individual drivers not knowing, because all the cars talk, all the autonomous ones. Everything's safe, everything's automated and, and coordinated, but you get a random person in there that doesn't know how it, it's all operating and, and waits too long at a red light or doesn't merge properly, it throws chaos in. Which is the first city that's going to say, I'm sorry, you have to park at the edge of town, you're not allowed to drive in the city anymore. And then if you're not driving, <laughs> you don't need investments in massive LRT, you don't need investments in street lights and stop signs and traffic signals, and it starts to look like a, an anthill or a beehive moving the way everything just sort of, you don't know, even know how it's communicating. But just think about the transformations that are coming along 15 years from now, and yes, then you apply that to, to a whole generation of millennials that I talk to that say, I'm, I'm never going to buy a vehicle. Why would I? I'm going to invest. No in kidding, and I'll tell you a funny thing, too. It's, it's in a garage. And then if they don't do that, think about how we redesign our communities. We've got communities with one and two and three car garages and big wide streets. If you don't have anything to park in the garage, are we even building the kind of houses we're going to need in 10 years or want in 10 years? Amazing how much is going to change. Now, another thing, and you talk about that as well uh, in your book about uh, 13 wells, uh, Ways to Kill Your Community, and, and I thought I'd bring this up as we're about to wrap up the show here, but I thought this was pretty important too, is how proactive a community is in its beautification to attract people to not only want to come to the community and live, but also want to stay. Uh, going back to Portland, Oregon again, uh, there is an area of the city uh, known as Northeast Portland, which was predominantly African-American, and I remember when I first moved up here back in the 80s. And it was kind of one of those areas that uh, seemed kind of rough. Uh, you seen uh, businesses being worn down, or buildings, excuse me, sort of being abandoned. But it wasn't like you would see in the inner big cities such as New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles. But certainly it had that look. But over a period of time, they began getting uh, more proactive in these areas and getting uh, black people to own and have black businesses. They were finding ways to help fund these situations. The next thing you know, they stepped up to date and they started refurbishing these buildings a little better. Uh, when it came to the graffiti problem, they said, well, why don't we go ahead and do this? Instead of you painting and marking this territory and making it look ugly, why don't you do a beautiful piece of art, a mural, if you will? And you go to this community today, and it is amazing what that area looks like. Even the buildings, they were starting to have newer buildings and new projects. You're beginning to see 
a lot of this proactivity going on to a level that there is a lot of business being attracted there. Uh, and, and, and you talk about that in your book, and, and the thing that was powerful about this is how these people proactively took an approach. Eventually, as they were getting the momentum, the government had to fall in place. If you're going to come in and talk the right business, we're going to hold it to you because we're going to be coming to you for these things you're promising. And if you can't do it, we're going to kick you right out of that spot, you see. So now government falls into place by doing exactly what they said they're going to do because there's a lot of power in these people being proactive. Let's talk about how sometimes a community can destroy itself based on beautification like parks and things like that, like what you talk about in your book. Yeah, well, I, you know what, when I do the presentation around North America, I, I often have people say, oh, you had 12 great ones, but then you, you ran out of ideas, you came up with Don't Paint, which is Chapter 6, and you stuck it in the middle so that we wouldn't notice because that's weak. That's just superficial, Doug. It's just judging a book by its cover. But uh, honestly, it, it matters. I mean, that outward impression, that first sign of uh, community just tells people. That gives them that first impression whether the community believes in itself, whether it's got some pride, whether it believes it's going to be successful. And so aesthetics is very important. I mean, you, whether we admit it or not, we, we don't look around and say, oh, my God, it, that guy's ugly. I need to go ask him out. You just don't. You're, you're attracted to aesthetically pleasing people. and Aesthetics authors. do matter. <laughs> yeah, they do. They matter a lot because it sends that message about what you're about. And I, so I tell people, you know, I, I wish I could pick a minivan out of a community in some of those, those large urban centers that are really run down, like Detroit, and put them in our communities and let you watch the reaction. Because in lots of our communities, they would lock the, wind, the doors and roll up the windows and just drive to get out of town because they're scared about getting shot or mugged. Well, in lots of our communities, we know that's not going to happen. But, but what message does that send? And when you start to beautify the community, people start to take pride, which just, which just returns investment because then they start to beautify their community, right? You, you fix the sidewalks and the main street, and you put flowers on the boulevards, and then people start to fix up their storefronts and mow their front yards. And then when they do that, they're planting more flowers. And then people are just, it makes, it changes the attitudes more than any of the others um, instantly because people suddenly have a pride in their community. So it, it matters incredibly to having that ownership and that feeling like, yeah, this is mine and I'm going to take care of it. And when, when you do that, then you start to take care of your neighbors and you start to take care of each other. And it just turns an entire community around. And so everyone who says, oh, it's just a, an ugly book, a cover on your book, well, lots of ugly covered books don't get read. And so it, if you want your community to get read, if you want people to be attracted, you need to, to worry about the aesthetics. It does matter. Now, speaking of aesthetics, I think this would be a great point in, uh, to touch on here. Uh, as I did a segment or a series of segments some years ago, about how Russia, for instance, has really changed the dynamics when it comes to food and food production. Now, when you talk about beautifying a community, and certainly you're beginning to see this grow on the horizon, which I find very encouraging because I think a predominant amount of our problems can be solved if everybody has something to eat. There's no doubt about that. Now, my wife's father, who lives in... in a, I think it's Skokie, Illinois, which is just right outside of Chicago. You go to his house, and what's really cool to see is his place is unlike any other place in his immediate neighborhood that's all in sight. His front yard is rich with things such as kale, green beans. You go to his backyard. I mean, everything he has in both his front and his backyard is something you can put on the stove or the tabletop. Every other yard has that beautiful green grass, maybe a cool-looking tree in the front yard. But literally, as I looked at the dynamics of this, there were two things that came to mind. A, this is a place that looks alive. And, and B, you know, it promotes an attitude of positive energy, where the rest of it is like, you look at the yard, well, I guess i got to bust out that lawnmower, and who really likes mowing the lawn on a Saturday rather than watching the ball game? And in Russia, that's exactly what they do. In fact, they were actually allocating houses to families where there were specific things that they needed to do in these small plots were to grow food. 
you go ahead and take what you need, and then the rest of it that you can't use, you go ahead and donate maybe to a local market or to other people. And, and you can grow in a very small area of yard quite a bit of food. And you're beginning to see these communities, these community agriculturally supported gardens and things like that coming alive. The organics are becoming more and more on the horizon. And you say to yourself, as you hear all these, geez, we're really sick of, for instance, these large corporations like Monsanto doing GMOs, this, that, and the other. Do you see the solution to this problem? You don't have to buy into protesting those guys. Just start in your own front or backyard. <laughs> Exactly. And imagine you go into a small community or even a medium-sized one where you see most of the yards, for instance, this guy really loves pears and cherry trees or this guy loves growing grapes to make his own wine. Just imagine what a community like that would look and feel like if you stepped into it. Yeah, well, we, we I know I've, I've written some articles on our website, which is 13ways.ca, just 13ways.ca, and Anyone can go look at them, but I've, I've talked about paving over the future. But we 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 put sod over over the future too. So it's pavement or sod, and it's um, underutilized land. And with the United Nations just announcing yesterday that they anticipate now they've upgraded the population figure so that by 2050, which is 32 years from now, uh, they anticipate we'll be close to 10 billion people on Earth. Food is going to become critical. And I know you're exactly right. We turn. Again, this is the same thing we do with government. We wait for government to fix it. So we turn to Monsanto and other co corporations and, and large grocery store chains and say, I, I want, I demand organic food. I will grow it. You can, you can do some of this yourself. You, it's not that you're necessarily going to grow everything you need, but if, if you get a movement in the community to, to stop you know, mowing lawn, and I frankly think uh, gardens are just as beautiful as lawn, and actually you that territory, you can do some amazing things and grow stuff naturally and organically. And you know, even even uh, we do that. We have a big garden in the backyard, half an acre, because we we want the kids to be still tied to. You know, I grew up on a farm. I want my kids to still get their hands dirty. I want them to watch something grow. I want them to go harvest it. I want them to know how to take care of it. That's that's part of our humanity. That's part of of our natural instincts that we're forgetting. I mean, our instincts were not to go to the grocery store to pick up stuff. They were go to go get it. That's that was our livelihood. And I think there's something soulful and therapeutic about still gardening. About and it and when a community does that, I think it becomes therapeutic and soulful for the community. It makes it stronger. And you know, not only that, but people begin sharing, and it's something that seems to be very natural in us. Yeah, it, it is exactly, and it's that's why it's soulful because it's not just about you growing food it's about the community doing it and then you get exchange of different foods and you you share information and there's something well technology takes over the rest of our lives there's something grounding about that and i so i think actually at, next to government agriculture is going through going to go through the next greatest disruption and I, you know we we pave and we plant lawn and we make nice overpasses and we push agriculture out to the fringes of our of our urban centers but urban agriculture, I think, is going to be the new revolution that occurs in, in urban centers. The University of Michigan has solar panels now. They were only an inch by an inch when they invented them three years ago, but they're clear. Think about the opportunity to derive solar power from a greenhouse. So the solar panels are no longer out in the field sterilizing the land. They make up the greenhouse so you generate solar electricity and you grow food. And you can do that mm -hmm. in urban settings. I think urban agriculture is is one of the biggest revolutions that are coming uh, for communities as well. I think it's very encouraging what our future looks like, but again, it's being uh, not only proactive about what that looks like, but also realizing don't wait for somebody to get out there on the dance floor and start the dance. Get out there and start it yourself. And one of the alarming things when you look at this last presidential election cycle was all the gee whiz, here's Trump or Hillary, whatever the case is, depending on what side you chose, screaming and whining about all these problems, and I say to myself, and I even said to others as I was listening to this directly with people, okay, I see that you see this problem here, so what are you specifically doing to create the solution about it? Uh, well, uh, see, that's the problem right there. If you recognize that's the problem, you automatically become responsible for the solution. 
So quit whining about who's going to be running and becoming the president. Why don't you go do something about it? That's what the last chapter is. Don't take responsibility. <clears throat> the best way to make sure you kill your community is to blame the mayor, blame the president, blame ISIS, the United Nations, big corporations. It doesn't really matter who you blame. Building a community comes right down to what are you going to do. What are you going to do? Not somebody else, you. And I don't know, we, it's easier when you, you blame somebody else. You can walk away from the challenges completely absolved of any sense of responsibility and guilt. The second you realize you, you need to own some of it, you'll do something about it. And so the key to success is to take responsibility. And the key to killing your community is to blame somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm reminded of some wisdom that a fifth grade World War II veteran teacher I had said one day, when you point your finger out at somebody to blame them for something, you need to remember that you have three fingers pointing back at you. And I didn't really totally get that when I was a fifth grader, but over the years that sinked in and I realized that is some of the wisest things I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so simplistic, but absolutely well, Doug, it's really been a pleasure to talk with you about this. I think it's very eye-opening. All of us should be reading this. Maybe you can find a way to put that into our curriculum, you know, in our schools that we need to really certainly revamp. The book is 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. Our guest today, Doug Griffiths. For our listeners out there, if you could, go ahead and give out that website again. Uh, yeah, it's www13, the number one, the number three, W-A-Y-S dot C-A, because we are in Canada. Uh, and there is all our contact information. There are videos that you can use, uh, present your community. There are blogs. There's all sorts of material. And if there's anything missing, uh, we welcome uh, calls so we can fill in some of those gaps. Because no matter what happens, I honestly believe that the most important job we have is building communities. Because if we have strong communities, then our, our families take care of themselves. They take care of each other. And that's the foundation for building a prosperous nation. I completely agree with you, Doug. Thank you so much for being on our program today and sharing this with us. Thanks, Daniel. You take care. You too. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Now you've got some tools, but get started and learn some more about these 13 ways so you can find out how you can be a solution to the things that you see around you that need solving. One of the ways you can also do that is by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. And also stay up to date on what's going on in Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming programs. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.